all great chance and opportunity to be here. Yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure. And um, I jumped in for David, who, who couldn't make it. Um, and uh, as, as uh, you already learned, um, I'm, I'm founder of a company that basically tries to do what we are going to talk about, uh, bringing together the mobility sector and the energy sector, um, and to, to do everything, actually, to, to get more and more renewables into the grid and combining these two systems. And, well, you, you all joined the session before, um, and just by listening to what we just heard, I think it is very clear that without being able to combine more and more and more sectors with the energy sector in a way that works with our biggest, one of our biggest problems we face uh, working against climate change, we will all have a major problem on this planet. Um, maybe just how I thought we can structure these minutes we have together here. Um, I would just briefly introduce you to our great panelists here. I will give you a very short introduction about the topic we are going to discuss and then give the panelists a chance to have an, a short intro statement to what we are going to discuss and then I would really like to open up the discussion in particularly with you um, and the panelists about things we have to do, we could do um, and what possible obstacles might be uh, to be overcome because obviously we like to send a message to people from governments, to people who are working with regulators about what is required to now make things happen. So, very briefly, um, I'm very happy uh, to have, um, well, representatives from different areas, you could say, very much required to bring both sectors together, mobility and energy transition. Uh, you could say this is, well, mobility, this is uh, energy uh, generation, um, this is uh, energy storage. And, um, well, let's, let's start with uh, Christian. Um, Christian Hofeld, uh, who is uh, the, the executive director of Agora Verkehrswende, which is uh, a, a German think tank um, about bringing together decarbonized mobility and uh, the energy system. I'm very happy that you're here. Um, uh, Christian has broad experience um, from this sector. He's not only working now with Agora uh, Verkehrswende, um, he uh, was working for the uh, GIZ, the, the German um, organization for, for international cooperation um, in, in China in the uh, sustainable transport sector before. And um, I'm very happy that you're here. Uh, you will kick off the uh, round of um, short statements um, and probably have to say a lot about how to bring energy transition um, and uh, mobility transition together. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Sarah here on board from Northwold, uh, a name that was named today I think already 15 times. <laughs> and um, well obviously Battery storage becomes more and more important. I mean, the biggest problem about uh, working towards 100% renewable energies, obviously, is storage. And um, so uh, battery electric storage um, appears to be one of the most promising technologies, um, as we heard, um, for, in particular, the mobility sector, but also for stationary um, appliances. So. Um, Great you're here, uh, in particular because you're not only working for Northwold, but uh, you have um, a lot of experience. Um, you, you are a founder um, of an own company. You're uh, a founder of an organization bringing more and more females into engineering positions, um, which I think is, uh, to be honest, one of the core conditions uh, to work successfully towards the big problems of our planet because we are wasting a lot of brilliant talents uh, in not bringing more and more women into engineering. Um, so um, great you're, uh, you're here. Um, we have Donald here, um, who is a, well, you could say a serial entrepreneur and uh, at the moment uh, is, is um, pioneering a technology that makes it possible that well, 
areas we have already, basically roads and ways, are not just wasted for mobility, but uh, can be used for energy production as well. Yeah, so he is representing today the, the generation side uh, of renewable energies. And uh, representing uh, Skeleton Tech is, is Igert. Um, great to hear. Um, storage is not only about um, battery electric uh, storage, but there are other ways to store electricity as well, very quick ways in, in reaction. And I think um, you, we won't be able to focus on just one technology um, for storage, and, but we need to find the best ways, um, which could be a sole technology for one application, but uh, which can be uh, a combination of technologies like batteries and supercapacitors uh, on the same way. So great you're here. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we are talking about the interface of renewable energies and mobility today. And um, maybe, maybe I briefly introduce myself by explaining what our company, what UB Tricity is doing, because it's, uh, it's a wonderful fit uh, about what we try to do and um, how big the obstacles are um, that we faced and face in introducing new technologies that actually really try to work us forward on that way um, in the reality, yeah, because I think uh, our discussion today should be a lot about what could be possible if not dot dot dot. Yeah. Um, so ubiquitousity derives from ubiquitous electricity. Yeah, so it's not from the password generator. Um, and um, ubiquitousity has a simple task to achieve. It's making the electric vehicle the battery electric vehicle, in this case, an integral part of our energy system. Um, we founded the company in 2008, yeah, so quite some time ago by now, because we were very sure that we would have to walk the way towards 100% renewable energies and asked ourselves, what do we require um, to work towards this goal? And uh, we were very sure that storage will be one of the most crucial things to have. And um, already in 2008, we were very sure that battery electric storage will be play at least one uh, important role and that we will see electric mobility based on battery electric storage because it has substantial advantages compared to other um, ways we drive today, in particular internal combustion engines, because the battery can not only be used for mobility purposes, it can serve another purpose, it can serve as an active player in the power grid, in our energy system, whenever the car is not driving. Yeah? So the passive times of the car can be used wisely and with a great advantage uh, for our energy system if you do some things. Basically, you have to make sure that the 22 hours a car is typically parking and not driving um, are used as connection times, yet then you need well, a smart connection time, and then you somehow need to allocate what the car contributed actually to the grid to someone, because either someone must pay for electricity or if it is a grid service being charging at a particular time or feeding back electricity to the power grid, you must be able to compensate this person for this car and this is why you somehow have to measure and meter the electricity and allocate it. And the only thing we did is, how would we organize the most efficient system where each and every car, not driving, is always intellig intelligently connected to the power grid? And, um, well, the, the simple solution uh, from our perspective is not to put the infrastructure in the middle of everything, but to put the car in the middle of everything, because the car is just, well, sorry about uh, that, uh, if car makers should be represented here, is more or less a moving battery. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big moving battery, and um, this battery is what we need to put into the energy system and what we need to commercialize, so we design our whole infrastructure around the car, put the car in the center, and it's very like uh, much like uh, building a system for telecommunication today. We are not putting the grid 
access point in the middle of the telecommunication and data access today. We are not building telephone booths, we are not building internet terminals everywhere you would like to access your telephone or data service. No, we are putting you in the middle and we provide you with an access device bundled with the contract you require to access your service. And this is what we do with cars. Cars are highly intelligent and practically already hold all the technology required to authenticate uh, itself towards the grid, communicate, um, measure electricity, and uh, be controlled smartly. So the car is basically enough to do that, and all we do is putting sort of a docking station to the grid side, because the car is doing the rest, and very much important, the car is bundled with an electricity contract of your choice, so it's about freedom of choice. The car is the asset with the contract. So you can choose your electricity supplier freely for your car and move it around. It's like your mobile phone just for electricity. This reduces infrastructure costs dramatically to a socket without a service, and that makes sure that the service is only where the car in fact is. So, it seems so easy, yeah? but, <laughs> and uh, but is a key word in what we will discuss today, <laughs> but, well, things being easily explained are not easily implemented in practice. Yeah. So, um, if you then go to anyone, someone you like to work with technology-wise, if you go to the regulator, if you go to finance, um, everyone says, is there already doing someone this? And well, obviously, because the idea is new, you say, no, that's the new way of thinking. Um, let's pioneer it. And it's really hard to find pioneers. <laughs> it's really hard to find pioneers. And I would say the, the session here now should be about you all being pioneers and not accept a but. Yeah? This is what I always try to achieve in, in such sessions, actually. It's so over for our planet. Yeah? If, you only, if you only start reading half an hour about what happened already and what we can't stop anymore with regard to climate change, it's so over. And we do not have any time at all, any time at all to wait. And we all here have to stand up and go to the middle-aged man, yeah, as it was called, <laughs> go to the middle-aged man and say, there are solutions if you're all not willing accept, uh, uh, to accept a but. Yeah, in, in just the panel discussion before, which I really liked because most of what we heard from my perspective was really encouraging and right, but all panelists used the word but. Yeah, we would, should do but. Yeah, um, there are opportunities in funding, in technology, in working together in the European field, but. That's right, there are a lot of buts, and buts is not a bad thing, but but needs to be overcome. And um, I think we have a lot of brains here in, in the room and uh, in the world, and we need to do a lot about overcoming the but. So, um, <laughs> let's, let's, start, uh, let's start the discussion about how we bring together the mobility sector and the energy sector. It's a lot to do. Christian, uh, you are working on it uh, to, to solve this situation uh, with Agora Verkehrswende. Um, maybe from, from your position, where are we in the transition process? And um, what is maybe, from your perspective, the biggest obstacle that we need to overcome um, to, to really make this happen, what we need to achieve? Uh, Frank and Ubertricity is working with a lot of confidence in the sector and uh, sector coupling um, and bringing the decarbonization of the transport sector a little bit uh, forward. But um, working in the field of transport for now uh, more than 25 years, um, I have a quote from, from Woody Allen, who's not that big transport expert, but um, he, he once said, you know, confidence is what you have before you understand the problem. And um, 
in this sense, I think what we need to do is to turn confidence into, you know, um, or to have confidence because we understood some of the problems. And um, I think we are not really there because um, whenever we have a session on transport or especially at the you know, borders of the transport sector, coupling it with the energy sector, um, we're talking about the problem child of the energy transition and, and the climate protection. Because as uh, Matthias mentioned in the earlier session, um, just taking Germany as an example, uh, since 1990, over the last quarter of a century, we were not able to bring down emissions by one ton. So we are still you know, having the same um, amount of emissions, uh, CO2-like or CO2-wise, um, uh, that we had in uh, 1990. And I mean, the shows that the pressure is growing. And uh, for a lot of time, it was very boring also to work in the transport field because nothing happened. But uh, over the last five years, I think uh, things are changing. Definitely things are changing because we get a better understanding and we get better opportunities to decarbonize the transport sector by coupling it with the energy sector. And I think this is very inspiring. Nevertheless, I think to do the decarbonization by more or less mid-century, um, we need two pillars to be implemented. The one is definitely the energy transition um, in the transport sector, so phasing out fossil fuel by mid-century, totally phasing out fuel. And I mean, this is uh, also working a lot with the uh, one industry sector, which is not the driver here, it's uh, not the car industry, it's the oil industry. So happy to join them uh, with this uh, effort to decarbonize also their sector. But on the other hand, um, without the mobility transition, also the energy transition in transport won't work because we are the, the energy demand in transport is too high to be able to cover it with renewables um, over the next decades because we don't we won't have enough renewables in the grid um over the next decades it's definitely needed to use it as energy efficient as possible so the mobility transition changing uh, the transport system to avoid unnecessary transport to shift from one mode to another from uh, road to rail but also to make the system more efficient with the help of digitization is definitely needed to bring down the energy demand by, let's say, about 50% until mid-century. That's kind of some role. To be then able to um, cover the rest of the um, energy demand by renewables. And talking about the second pillar, which is mm, definitely the focus of our session today, not forgetting the mobility transition. Maybe we can dive into it later on, especially the mobility transition in cities. I think electrification is the key technology. Um, and we were really stuck in a huge of discussions, and we are still stuck in the huge of discussions. Is it battery electric vehicles? Is it hydrogen or um, fuel cell vehicles? Is it um, power to liquid, power to gas? Which is the most favorable technology? And I think um, that is a very unfruitful discussion because the decision has been made mainly also by the car industry, it will be battery electric vehicles, at least in the passenger car sector over the next decade, which will dominate the energy transition in transport. We will see 300 models electrified or um, half electrified by plug-in hybrid electric vehicles coming to the European market within the next five years. So if we don't make this a great success, um, also, with regard to climate protection, we will, on the one hand, not be able to invest in new technologies from the car company's perspective, because if their investments fail, definitely there is no chance that they develop other technologies like hydrogen further to see if they can be uh, a good addition to the electrification. But also, I mean, if we fail, we will never ever get our targets done in the transport sector. So four things needs to be happen, and there are two huge problems with this. First, the availability of models must be there. Still, we have like 20 electric models on the road, which is definitely nothing compared to 400 electric, uh, non-electric um, uh, 
still um, combustion engine models on the road. So the availability I mentioned, the cars will come, the models will come due to the European regulation on CO2, which is definitely the biggest driver um, reducing the emissions from the new sold fleet by the car companies by 37.5% until 2030. The second thing is, from my perspective, and you were asking this, what is the biggest barrier, is the biggest barrier how to make electric vehicles the most affordable car um, in the world or in the markets. Um, that needs to an adoption of the whole fiscal system we definitely or we currently have. Um, and this means we have to adopt the fiscal system of each of the European member states in the next years, which is definitely an issue because fiscal policy is national policy. The Commission won't be the driver. Um, so we need an adoption of uh, you know, the point of sales. We need definitely a new regulation on um, car taxes, so owner ownership taxes. But we definitely also need carbon pricing or um, user fees of the roads to adopt um, the, the costs, the life cycle costs of the car to make electric vehicles more affordable. That means we have to internalize external costs for uh, internal combustion engines fueled um, with the fossil fuels, and we have to bring down um, the costs for electric vehicles also by subsidies um, which can be you know, offset by uh, higher costs and higher fees for um, uh, fossil fuel cars. The third thing is then linking the transport system with the energy system in a way that we will have also um, the benefits from uh, uh, the reduction of um, the fossil fueled electricity in the grid. And that means charging infrastructure definitely is one thing you mentioned there, but also, you know, coupling the sector with the energy sector means we definitely also need more extension of the distribution networks in the future. And uh, we did a huge study there, which I think is very promising. It showed that um, even if you, you know, electrify the whole fleet now in Germany, 45 million cars, which is not you know, you know, um, we won't see this. Hopefully, that we need to um, subsi or substitute 45 million cars. Maybe we can reduce the fleet a little bit. But even if we do so, I think it pays for the distribution network companies to um, build up the networks, and they can do this with the electrician e electricity grid fees of the new demand side of the new cars coming into the fleet, and. What we need is definitely a regulation on managed charging. If we only if we can do this in a managed way, that the cars can be you know differentiated and cars can be um, charged in a way that it's great for the grid and it's also reflecting the renewables and the status of renewables in the grid, then we will achieve this. And this is, I think, the biggest burden that we have to introduce a managed charging system um, and. Second burden is also that we have to uh, extend our renewables in the grid, and this is where we definitely struggle at the moment in Germany, because the wind production and or the production of uh, wind um, mills and and also solar power systems um, is decreasing. So that are, from my perspective, the biggest challenges and tasks at the moment. On the one thing, adopting the costs, adopting the fiscal systems for electric vehicles and to um, promote the market uptake of electric vehicles by adjusting the fiscal system. And secondly, linking the transport system and the energy system with a good charging infrastructure and the extension of the distribution networks in a perfect way, uh, which definitely needs a lot of new regulation um, on the sector coupling, um, which will be bring new business models to uh, success, like your business model, uh, which you are doing with electricity. Christian, thank you very much. Um, very interesting um, as, as opening statement. Uh, one, one question right um, now. If you would be in the position of the European regulator or legislator, and you would have one shot, one wish, free, 
yeah, that you could decide. I'm, I'm totally with Matthias when he said probably Germany would have done nothing with regard to the mobility sector if there wouldn't have been European regulation um, make a bringing into a threshold for, for CO2 emissions um, that was so strict that they actually had to go for different alternatives uh, from com internal combustion engines. Um, so I, let's, let's not talk about national um, legislators and national regulators. Let's talk about the European one. You have one shot. What do you decide to solve at least, well, most efficiently, a lot of what you have seen as obstacles now? Well, um, one shot is definitely not enough. But um, <laughs> let's say the, the first shot from my perspective um, for the new legislative period of the U European Commission. So what will be most important um, as we have already the CO2 standards for passenger cars and heavy duties in place, which I think is really the, the main driver. I think from my perspective to make this work in a European way, we definitely need a very strong alternative fuel infrastructure directive, which is at the moment it's not the case. We have a really very weak one and I think uh, the, to strengthen this alternative fuel infrastructure directive on the European level, meaning that you have to, that member states have to build up the charging infrastructure, have to, you know, renew their distribution networks for uh, making it possible that more electric vehicles come in the fleet. And linking this with financial aid from the structural funds maybe is the most important step um, to prepare the European market for an uptake of electric vehicles in the passenger car sector. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, um, well, obviously, if you go to a car dealer or try to online order an electric vehicle today, um, you probably would say, whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> what I'm going to pay for being able to drive uh, electrically. And well, obviously, the main reason for the, the pricing of the cars is not that the car is such expensive, but still the battery is. Um, so, I think, as, as Christian just said, um, the, the well acceptance of electric mobility is very much depending on what we will have to pay for the car and how we are able to bring down costs for batteries, um, be it by, by just scaling up uh, production processes or by new battery chemistry or whatever. So, maybe um, after explaining a little bit how, how you see the, the connection between the energy transition on the one hand and the role of batteries uh, and mobility, on the other hand, you can briefly explain what you think will be the path for batteries and the role of the battery cost in, in making all this uh, intersection happen between mobility, electric mobility and uh, the uh, energy transition. Yeah, sure. So thank you for having me here. And as you noticed, I work for Norfolk today. And I was, yeah, in the start, when I joined, we were 20 people. We only had PowerPoints. We had no customers. <laughs> we had nowhere to build a factory. No one believed we will succeed. <laughs> and now, like two and a half years later, we're 500 people almost. And we have a lot of customers. And everybody think we will succeed except for us no i'm kidding but <laughs> <laughs> we're more uh, now we know the problem we're facing <laughs> you know <laughs> and the more you know the more you know oh wow this is a lot to do but i think the the thing about norfolk is it's not a secret recipe like we don't have a new battery cell technology that's going to solve everything we don't have uh, you know any specific hidden technology that we're going to show to the world it's just a lot of hard work in a great team. And I think it's a good role model on how far you can get on just working hard with a great team. So what we do, I mean, we take current lithium ion technology, or when I say current, it's not the ones that is in the car today. The, the, the lithium ion technology we'll see in a few years, because the people we have in our cell design team comes from Korea and Japan and knows the latest and greatest when it comes to battery cells. But it's not like a noble, chemistry price when it when we look at what the type of batteries we're going to do. Although what we are going to do is that 
we looked into how do you produce batteries? And we broke it down. So as you already knew, like, okay, so what is the CO2 emission in the world? You look at it and you say, okay, a lot comes from transportation. Looking at transportation, uh, how can we increase it here? Well, we could go from diesel to electric. If you go from diesel to electric, what is the biggest headache? Okay, biggest cost and biggest weight and biggest volume in the electric car is the battery. What's the problem in the battery? Okay, it's the battery cell. Now, if you look at a battery cell, why does it cost so much and why does it weigh so much? And then when you break the battery cell down, you notice, okay, to make a battery, you need very good uh, raw materials and you need energy and you need clean water. And if you have those three factors, you could do a great battery. So what we're looking at is where can we find a raw material? We've spent a lot of time talking to mines and mineral suppliers and refineries, understanding where can we get lithium, where can we get cobalt, where can we get nickel, where can we get manganese? And not only them, we're also looking how can we recycle batteries? And that's something no one ever done before. Why? Because the battery industry for like the last 30 years has been really dirty. No one wants to work in it and you can't earn any money on it. Because until now, we didn't use batteries in the amount we will use the coming years. We had a battery in our cell phone pretty recently and it's one battery per person. If you look at an electric car, it's like 20,000 battery cells. So you're increasing the need of batteries dramatically and all of a sudden it becomes a business. Before it was just an industry, it wasn't a business. And if it's not a business, people with brains don't go into that, right? Because <laughs> you can't earn money. Now it is. And when you start looking at it, you can say, wow, you could do this so much better, so much more effective and in a lot smarter way. So that's basically what Norfolk is about. So when it comes to Cheaper batteries, yes, but also more sustainable batteries and more effective batteries. There are so many things you could do in the battery supply chain that can be improved. And looking at electricity, that's another reason for us locating in Sweden instead of for China. So looking at the CO2 footprint of producing batteries, uh, a lot is from the electricity you need when you produce the batteries. You need a lot of electricity to do the slurries and the chemicals uh, and the chemistry mixes. And then you need a lot of electricity for the formation and aging. That's the final step of producing a battery cell. So when you charge and discharge and characterize the battery cell. And if you do that with renewable energy, your CO2 footprint is almost gone. When we calculate now, when Norfolk 1 in Skellefteå, Norfolk 1, is going to be up and running in a few years, our CO2 footprint sometimes is even positive because we produce uh, w w heat waste that we will give back to the Skellefteå city, which means in some of the processes, our carbon footprint is zero, which is crazy because you always see batteries as something that produce a lot of carbon footprint. Yeah, in the way we do them today, but you haven't explored and how you can do it in another way. Uh, so that's the other part of, of doing the batteries. And of course, if you do it with cheap Swedish electricity that's very stable, the batteries will become cheaper. So I think in a few years, the electric car won't be that expensive. And I hope, really, because I mean, I can't still afford one. It's embarrassing, but I need to drive a diesel car because I can't afford an electric one. And also I have, you know, I have my baby and my dog, so I need a big car. I can't do the i3. Then my family won't fit in the car. So, <laughs> I mean, looking at the options I have, it's like, no, I don't have 120,000 euros in my pocket. So I just sit and wait then. And we take the bus for another <laughs> year or two. But but that's the truth. And, and I mean, that's why uh, I think uh, the initiative Norfolk is doing is not only about us doing a battery factory, it's about creating a new ecosystem, both for Europe, but also for the world, where you put batteries on the agenda, you make them sustainable, you make them cost effective, and you create, yeah, a, like an ecosystem around it, because the more players we get into this, the more effective the batteries will get, yeah. This sounds really encouraging, thank you very much. Um, just one question with regard to obstacles. Yeah. Um, well, as we heard already, Northwold, uh, in, a, in a very impressive way, uh, was able to, to fund the growth for the next years, at least. And um, so maybe not the money is in the middle of everything at the moment, but I'm very sure there 
other obstacles Northvolt or the battery industry um, are facing with regard to growth, with regard to bringing together the energy system and, uh, and storage? Um, maybe, uh, can you say maybe very briefly something with regard to your, from your position, biggest obstacle in terms of making this all happen? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, sometimes people at Norfolk tend to be very positive because uh, we get so much butts all the time. So, <laughs> so we try to be the brain in the room and telling everybody, yeah, it is possible. It's just a lot of hard work. But yeah, we're 95% we're obstacles. It's not that easy. <laughs> and I would say when you look on the obstacles, it's been funding for a very long time now. I mean, since I joined, uh, it's been fundings and it's been our economical situation because we know we're not going to earn money for many years to come either. We need to build an extremely expensive factory now until we actually produce anything. But that hasn't actually been the biggest obstacle because the more time goes, the more we just get proven that we're working on the right track. And the more people understand, okay, it's not about um, if they're going to succeed or not. It's more that do I want to be part of this journey and help out. And I think when we got BMW, we got Scania, we got Vestas, we got all of these big players and finally also Volkswagen, it was more of them understanding, okay, this is happening. Uh, maybe I should take my seat before the seats are full. And we needed to discuss it. The biggest obstacle I see we have is um, people. And I'm saying that because all the obstacles can be solved with the right people. And it's really tricky today to get the right people on board. So right now, I only work with uh, recruitment. I'm actually an engineer from the beginning, and my first position with a company was within uh, battery systems, working out uh, battery systems for mining trucks. Uh, I switched to recruitment now, and I mean, this is the most important headache for the company to get the right competence on board. Uh, and in, in all areas, uh, it's really difficult. And we're not educated for, for this in Europe, you could tell. And sometimes it doesn't matter how much will you have. If everybody lacks the competence, you can't learn from anyone. <laughs> so we need a few people on board who can teach the other ones. And we need to be excellent in teaching others because it's like, okay, if one out of 100 at a company knows how a battery cell works, they will be full uh, teaching everybody else. So that's something that we work a lot on at Norfolk to encourage like universities and schools to, to teach the technology and not to teach it at rocket science. So we have a saying at Norfolk, don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to make anyone sad now, but we say don't hire a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because they studied too much and did too little in the reality. Because the thing with Norfolk is we're not doing research. It's digging. I mean, here's the shuffle, you go dig. We have so much things to do. Don't sit and work on formulas. <laughs> and, and, and that's also a thing when it comes to finding the right people. I mean, they need to be smart and need to be willing to work. And I think we have a good time here in Europe, and especially in Sweden. Swedish engineers, you know, it's prime time. They get paid good, and it's not, you know, the companies are going good. Yeah, I get paid anyways. And that's not the case we need. So it's really hard to, to find the right people to get on board. Th thank you very much for making this point. I, I couldn't agree more from the uh, learnings of the last 10 years um, in terms of bringing on board right people uh, with the right motivation and not necessarily with the deepest skill set, but with the, the right combination of, of both. Uh, I think it's a really crucial point. And uh, thank you very much for the encouraging um, words. I think uh, really a lot of this is uh, could be a role model, as you said, for, for other companies as well, because I think it brings together the right um, positions from different actors to be willing to take risk because they know they have to do something, even if they are not knowing whether this road will succeed in the end as only road and right road. And um, so let's switch from storage to generation, actually. Um, as we heard today, uh, the willingness to accept uh, the renewable uh, generation in Germany, for example, was already higher. Yeah, it decreased a little bit. Um, people are not so much willing to accept onshore wind 
Yeah, when we look at uh, um, state elections in, in Thuringia uh, at the moment, for example, a lot of the political parties try to position themselves by being against onshore wind uh, and putting up more renewable energies. Um, so offshore wind, as we heard uh, in, the, in the morning session, could be an option. Uh, I personally believe that solar is, is really, really one of the most important things because it's easy, it's cheap, and uh, depending on where you are installing it, it's practically invisible. Um, Donald, <laughs> I'm curious uh, to, to learn uh, your view on that situation. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Yes, the idea of Solmove I founded is very, very simple. We just want to use existing areas to produce clean energies, and we have a lot of them. We have streets, uh, we have parking lots, we have railway tracks, we have bike lanes and other areas. They are not really used uh, for other things than only to, to carry cars or carry pedestrians. So the idea of Solmove is to develop a special surface that we can bring on existing asphalt or concrete, and this surface is already producing energy by the sun. Um, we will integrate light also to make traffic signs, to make illuminations, to increase or to improve the safety of these traffic areas. We will bring in special functionality to heat up this surface, to bring the snow away, maybe important for Sweden. Uh, it's much more cost efficient to, to do it in an electrical way. And the third thing is to bring into the surface also sensors that we can see what's, what's happened on the surface. Uh, so we will produce data to improve the traffic situations. And the last point is a little bit visionary, uh, maybe not so good for North uh, Walt. Uh, we want to reduce the amount of batteries in the cars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. The vision is that the electricity is generated in the surface of the street, comes into the cars directly with inductive charging. In the first step while parking and in the second step while driving. And I believe that we will have enough renewable energies in Germany to support the um, traffic needs. We make an inquiry in a, in a city, Bad Hersfeld, in the middle of Germany, um, we look which areas, which street are able to use economic uh, to, to install uh, our modules. And we saw around 25% uh, of all streets we can use. So if we calculate that up to the whole German situation, we can say we could generate electri electricity for 20 million cars. Yeah, that, that's a lot. And so we believe that it should be possible to do that. We have some obstacles as well. Um, but the main, the main vision is to bring the electricity directly into the cars because the cars have normal cars driving 40 kilometers around a day. And the battery they need could be very small if they are able to charge again and again and again, like our mobile phones. We do that every day. Yeah? So I believe if we could bring that through the political level. <laughs> it, we, we would have a chance to use existing areas to produce a lot of electricity. Talking about the political level um, and bringing it through it, what would be from Solmove's perspective something that would really help you to bring technology quicker and more comprehensive into, into the field? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very the most important point. You just ask him in before what he would do if he would be a major for one day, yeah. if I would have this position. I would say we don't need more regulations, we would need less regulations. We would need a space who's really free to do things. Uh, we we are very conditioned always to look to the politicians, politicians to, to do things in the right way. Um, I think it should be better to do it another way. First, we need the innovations and the, people, the people's freedom to do things, to learn things, 
to do things better and better, and one day we need the politicians to make a rule to, to organize it a little bit better, but not opposite. Yeah? So I would say we don't need more Hubraum, we don't need more free, uh, Freiraum, freedom. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, um, well, last not, but not least, um, <laughs> um, storage again, and not only storage with uh, batteries, but uh, with supercapacitors. Um, maybe you can briefly explain um, what, what Skeleton is doing and um, uh, what the, the view technology-wise on, on how mobility could work, or not only mobility, but for this session, mainly mobility could work with renewable energies. And, um, what the, the obstacles you face uh, are, in, in fact. Okay, so <clears throat> let me tell you a story, and it's not about me. Uh, it's about an, a chemical engineer in MIT in 1980s. And at that time, as you might remember, the computers were not that powerful, but they already, but uh, they already were doing computer simulations of chemical reactions. Wonderful. But they had a little problem. Every morning, at around the same time, I don't know, was it 7 or 8 o'clock, there would be a lot of hair dryers switched on round about the same time. So basically, they had a deadline. Every morning, and they had a voltmeter on top of the computer, Com sorry, the cupboard, which was the computer. Uh, when it starts dropping, ah, then you better be done. Because the little university grid was not able to supply all the power which the hairdryers needed. And the hair hairdryer is I think a couple of hundred of watts, but if you have them coming on in thousands and thousands, okay, that's too much. But yes, it uh, produces a flicker in the grid which shuts down the computer. Now, imagine all these people driving in the morning to work uh, within about an hour of each other somewhere between, between 8 and 9 o'clock mostly, arriving at work and plugging in their cars. What's going to happen? Well, you might need regulation to say that uh, you need to control the grid frequency, which would mean that you need to supply the energy to these vehicles quickly. You need a power reserve. And if you have such a short-term peak like that, then, I'm sorry, but batteries are not the final answer to that. You need something which can discharge faster than batteries and still have enough energy to do that cost-effectively. And this is where our company comes in, that we are able to produce ultracapacitors or supercapacitors, ultracapacitors is a marketing term, ultra is better than super, right? <laughs> <coughs> or I, I could be talking about electric double layer capacitors, which is the official term. Anyways, supercaps. Um, up to this point, they have had not enough energy content. And um, any idea how much a kilowatt hour of energy storage in supercapacitors would cost today without the module costs or, or anything anything related to the system, just the cells. Well, in batteries, they are talking about that, you know, maybe some deals have already been done below $100 per kilowatt hour. Uh, there's a person here I could ask, but um, maybe not publicly. But <sighs> ultracapacitors are about four and a half thousand euros per kilowatt hour. So it's, it has not been a real energy storage uh, industry. It has been a power industry. 
a megawatt second, not kilowatt hour business. But with our technologies, we hope to change that. And right now we have tripled the energy density of ultra capacitors. We hope to raise that uh, again by uh, a factor of three. That would bring down the ultra capacitor based energy storage cost to about 250 euros per kilowatt hour in about six years or so. And if that is the case, then when you look at the discharge profile of one hour, then no battery can compete. Is, uh, that is when you count in uh, the lifetime, the number of cycles you have. Yep, and that's it. That's, uh, well, you know, a battery has, let's call it, 3,000 cycles, ultra capacitors have a million. So you install them and you forget about them. You do not have servicing costs. That is the big idea. Thanks a lot. Um, two questions, actually. Oh. Um, what would you think? What would you think would be the the well most efficient size of the the supercapacitor um, storage on board a vehicle? Um, or in the infrastructure, depending on where you locate it, to uh, combine it with the battery storage of the car, because what I got is that you're not seeing the supercapacitor as a full replacement of the, the traction battery, but, but uh, more or less as a um, complementary technology, um, um, solving problems from the grid side in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, second question again uh, to the, the obstacle. Um, you face with the company or um, basically with your technology uh, in terms of making it easier because it's, it's well obviously paying towards this intersection of, of energy transition and um, electric mobility very much. What's the biggest obstacle? Is it regulatory framework? Is it people yeah, bringing on board right talents? I mean, you're located in Große Röstorf, for example. Mm -hmm. um, which I happen to know by chance uh, because I visited it in 1990 between the wall came down and uh, the reunification. And uh, it's, um, it's amazing to know that such technology companies are now located in, in this area. But still, I can imagine bringing on board right people is not always easy. Yeah, um, It's not like uh, uh, that there is a huge brand or a, y a huge city attracting people already. Um, or is it money? Yeah, So is it funding? What, what are your obstacles? So where should I start? Um, when it comes to integration of supercapacitors into vehicles, then there are two camps of thought. Uh, that in full battery electric vehicles, that may or may not happen. But they do bring on one specific benefit and that is that if ultra capacitors, super capacitors uh, provide the power for, or most of the power for acceleration and braking, the kinetic energy recovery during braking, then the battery chemistry, which is required for this vehicle, can be uh, adjusted more towards higher energy density and lower power density. And quite often, I'm not a chemist or a battery engineer, but I have, I have been told, I have come to an understanding that making a battery deliver high power makes it usually more expensive. And ultra capacitors can at least ameliorate this problem by supplying the peak loads. Mm -hmm. And there was quite a few years ago, University of Rome did uh, test on the first generation Nissan Leaf, which had a really small battery, 24 kilowatt hours. I once tried to drive uh, 200 kilometers uh, with that car in minus 25 degrees centigrade. And I realized that there's no, no use to try to reach the destination using as little energy as possible. Instead, I just 
drove at high speed and I charged every 50 kilometers because it accepts the charge really fast that uh, for the first 60% uh, of, of uh, the charging. But in that car, they added just 15 kilos of ultra capacitors, not ours, I'm afraid, it was before us, just 15 kilos, and they realized that, for example, the inter inner city range went back up to 170 kilometers, which it should have been there from the start, instead of around 100. And that is because ultra capacitors took the load of the battery. And they also calculated that the battery lifetime would extend by 40%. Now, of course, this is with a small battery. This is not something you see in a Tesla with a 100 kilowatt hour battery because that battery can take a lot more power. But anyways, there is a chance, there is a possibility that ultra capacitors can be combined with batteries in battery electric vehicles to make them last longer, be even faster, if you wish. Um, but we shall see. Obstacles? It's cost. None. <laughs> it's, 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 it's always cost. And I want to come back to the point about regulation. Uh, and I'm usually with the gentleman on my left hand that, that don't do too much regulation. What I think is needed is that electric cars should, be, should become considerably cheaper than uh, internal co combustion engine cars. And that would trigger more demand, which would then in turn uh, put more demand on the electricity network, which would trigger developments, development of the network. And I think the, there is only one regulation you need there, and that is keep the grid frequency at a certain range. If you don't do that, you are not allowed to put in your system. I think that's the only regulation we would need. So when you, when you were saying that, yeah, you have one shot, that's my shot, but that's already there. Interesting point, thank you very much. Well, that was uh, a lot to digest for um, the first statements here, basically, but I think it gave us very good um, well, understanding about how different the obstacles can be. Um, I, I would be really interesting, interested now to open the round. We have around 25 minutes left of the session um, to address questions or actively address other obstacles you see to bring together these two sectors. And well, if you could wish for something, uh, that would take out these obstacles, obstacles um, be it a financial one, a regulatory one, or whatever, um, that would be very interesting to learn. Here we go. Thank you. Um, I have a question to Sarah about uh, sustainable supply chains and how you in concretely um, work now with greening uh, supply chains when it comes to lithium mining uh, and all the other minerals you mentioned. Um, because wherever these minerals come from, whether, whether they come from Chile or uh, from Congo, they have very specific problems, so very different sustainable development goals that are in, in interest locally. Um, are you envisioning that from Europe we will be kind of auditing the su supply chains and monitoring the whole supply chains, or are there some other mechanisms that uh, maybe come from the political side uh, that could help to green the whole supply chain and then that will cost more money, but then uh, secure that, uh, let's say, our industry stays competitive because we could lock out other competitors that are not uh, working on sustainability in their whole supply chains. So that's my question. Uh, very good question, and I get this question a lot, both from, I mean, people who are interested in Norfolk, like customers, investors, but also people who want to start working for us, because they're like, hmm, are you a fraud? Like, I heard cobalt is not so sustainable, and you have it in your batteries. <laughs> so, <laughs> the thing is that, as I said before, battery industry was not a business, it was an industry, and the supply chain of a battery cell is very long. So we could do an example, for example, say, 
maybe a, a car that is uh, electric, that's very famous and very expensive today. And if you look on the batteries they have in there, you can think, oh, but that they were produced in, in the factory in the US, right? Hmm? But then they have this collaboration with Panasonic, so the actual active material and the roll comes from uh, Japan or maybe Korea or maybe China. And then the active material in there had been both in New Zealand, in France, in Congo, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the supply chain of the actual producing battery cells is like 15 steps. Whereas you, as an end supplier, might know that you have an Apple phone. You might even know that in your Apple phone, the battery is Samsung or Panasonic. Then it stops. You don't know where the actual thing in the battery comes from and very few do, because they haven't looked in the supply chain. The thing with Norfolk, we won't have our own mines, but we have gone so far back in the supply chain that we do our own active material for some of the materials and our own refineries for some of the materials that we know exactly where we buy our raw material from which I would say no other battery cell manufacturer do today. They can't state this is where we buy the materials. They buy it from several places, but there are so many sub-suppliers underneath there, so they don't know. And if you know, you could act. And what we have done, I mean, the, our head of environmental, Emma, she's been to Congo several times to visit actual mines. I don't think people working at the other battery companies ever actually been to the mines where they get the raw materials. And then we can see, okay, they are better and they are worse. Now our, our goal and aim is to buy as little raw materials possible and have as, most, as much recycled as possible. And that's why we're building the recycling uh, factory next to our factory up in collection. So that's one thing. The other thing is there are a lot of active materials up in the northern of Europe. You can find nickel and cobalt and other active materials that we need for batteries up there. The mines has, is not active, but there are findings that are active. And since we um, started our process with Norfolk, saying that we would be in a factory up in the northern Sweden, the application for starting mines has gone up like 500%. <laughs> because now people understand in the northern of Sweden and northern of Finland, like, oh, but they want to buy this material. Then it makes sense for me to start the mine. Now, there is another obstacle when it comes to regulations. It's not environmental friendly to start a mine. So <laughs> many of the uh, applications has been denied. And it's a bit ironic, right? Because it's like, okay, but uh, moment 22 here, maybe it's more environmental funder to start a mine up in Northern Finland that would produce material in an ethical, good way to the battery factory than to not start it at all. So, but, but we work on several levels. Uh, and when it comes to, for example, uh, lithium, we have a partnership with Lithium Nebra in Nebraska, where we'll build a lithium refinery together with them. Uh, and there we know exactly where the lithium come from and everything and to ensure that. When it comes to cobalt, uh, I think actually the first two years we won't even have cobalt from Congo. We have uh, sourced it from other places because uh, there's, there's more uh, than Congo when it comes to cobalt. Eventually we will probably need it, but then we will know exactly where uh, that cobalt came from and in what way it would mine and we will visit that supplier often and have a close relationship to that. So again, it's not about like inventing the wheel, it's hard work and, and learn the process and learn your supply chain. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Further questions, remarks, obstacles? Please. Just a remark regarding uh, uh, your, your uh, how to say a remark about procuring raw materials. I know by coincidence a Swedish startup, Altris, who offers uh, cathode material made of lithium, uh, I think lithium, and phew, now, sorry, I, I got caught, but it's not cobalt. And they they just looking for somebody who can uh, uh, help them to scale up their business. I can give you the contact if you might be interested in. Thanks. Ah, here we go. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the uh, participants. It was a really nice and inform really informative uh, discussions. I have a question mostly for Christian and also like for all of you as well. Um, 
Yeah, electric mobility is really important, but um, what are your opinions about mobility as a service? I would say mostly like car sharing, um, because like for example, there are also some studies, it's going to be quite crucial in the future, and uh, we also have problem like um, traffic problem or the usage of areas in the city centers, most of them are used for the parking lots and so on, also the highways and um, also like most of the car companies, I think they're also seeing it as an option, that's why most of them are also, some of them are in investing in, for example, car to, car to go is Daimler is investing or Daimler has the company. So I would love to ask your opinions about that, but of course it's a question for all of you. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much for this question. and. Um, bringing this up because, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, without the mobility transition, uh, we won't be able to get the decarbonization of the transport sector um, uh, successful. Um, only the energy transition in transport uh, won't do the, uh, all what we need to do. So mobility as a service, at least in um, our cities, will play a major role. Um, we have the you know, work of the International Transport Forum, which did some of the calculation when uh, for Lisbon, for cities like Dublin, Helsinki, showing that um, if we transform the urban transport system away from a system where we mainly rely on uh, privately owned vehicles and on individual mobility, um, in a, to a system where we um, rely on public transport combined with uh, robot taxis or at least pooled taxis, uh, that's most important. Automatization doesn't play a big role, but sharing is a big role. Then definitely we can um, reduce the transport volume by about 40% and the fleet of the car to a size less than 10%. I mean, this is an ideal simulation. It won't happen, but definitely it shows that we can reduce the fleet in the cities to a certain extent, and I think this is um, invaluable because we have to pool, like uh, in other you know parts um, and in other sectors, pooling will be crucial for freight transport, but also for uh, passenger transport. Acceptance will play a huge role. I mean, will people accept that their you know mobility is not as private as they are used to it? That's uh, I think a huge issue, and also. And um, what we see by all the studies done worldwide now where mobility as a service is uh, more ahead, and I mean mobility as a service will play the major role in the fastest growing cities. So Germany with cities like Bielefeld, Celle, um, maybe there is no big pressure on the transport system, so we won't see a huge drive, but if you talk about Beijing, Shanghai, Jakarta, you know, those cities which also feel the pain of the transport system already much more, they will go in this direction. Um, and this also needs uh, disincentivizing um, the passenger cars. So um, a huge or a strict policy on parking, maybe a congestion fee, but also emission zones will play a huge role to drive um, uh, the world into more mobility as a service. And I think without this, that are the studies which we already have, it can have also a negative impact. So the political framework, again, will play the major role in deciding if mobility as a service will also contribute to decarbonization or not. And in this regard, I opposed another time saying we need less regulation. No, we need the right regulation. And um, we don't have the right regulation, but without regulation, you know, those innovation can also go in the wrong direction. That's uh, pretty sure. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I would like to connect one further question to this because uh, thank you very much for making this point. Um, well, energy transition and mobility transition is not only about electric mobility, obviously. It's about, in particular, mobility transition is about rethinking our transport yeah. system at all. Um, I'm not quite sure if you know where you are today. Yeah? This is not Berlin. <laughs> this, is Brenden this is Brandenburg. And this uh, little village you're here is called Klein Machno. Um, Klein Machno is basically, was, used to be an artificial village. It was created when Berlin 
grew the most in its history. So um, the industrialization uh, made Berlin grow at the late 19th uh, century, beginning of the 20th century, incredibly fast. It's, it's not imaginable what happened in this city by the standards we know today, unless you look to China, maybe. Yeah. Um, and the whole village here, so for many thousands of people, was built from scratch in the early 20th century, right before the borders of uh, Berlin. And uh, obviously, for transportation, at some point it was connected by a train um, to make it easy to travel from here to Berlin. Well, you know what happened to Berlin after World War II, so um, by now we, we are here in the, in the former uh, German Dep Democratic Republic, and uh, well, there was the, the iron border between Kleinmachnow and Berlin. Um, it's just some meters uh, from here. And um, they, they cut the, the train, basically. And until today, I mean now, this year, we're basically celebrating 30 years of the wall coming down. Um, we do not have a train connection from Kleinmachnow to Berlin. If you want to travel from this place to Berlin, you have to take the car or the bus or the bike or wherever. There is not a train connection. And um, well, Kleinmachnow by now is as expensive to live at like Berlin because Berlin is like growing a lot again. And maybe an another question to you here. Be just this taking as an example, what do you think is required in the mobility transition to in the end really make it from an economic but ecologic perspective as well um, in terms of how we commute, how we travel? Is the individual electric car really the way to go to commute from Kleinmachnow to Berlin Mitte? I don't think that is an answer, uh, a question. It's uh, rather already, um, you know, uh, seeing the answer. First, I think um, uh, I'm not sure if the hosts of the hotel are now very happy that you demystified their title, saying you know they are Berlin Potsdam Conference Center. It's uh, now Klein Machno Conference Center. Um, <laughs> But as a Berliner, I also had to look up where this uh, place is, and I was a little bit shocked because it was quite far. So I had to, <laughs> from the place I live. Uh, no, but um, I mean, definitely it's not the, uh, you know, the right way. Um, I think we have an idea how to transform the urban transport. We can also say that, uh, you know, rural transport or transport in rural areas doesn't have to change a lot. But the most important thing is to solve the question, how do we link the rural areas with the city centers? So how do we commute? And in this regard, I think um, integrating the you know, mass transit together with the last mile connections and the last mile connections on demand services, I think would and will play the major role for um, you know, asking the question if we come up or come from a system where we definitely have 90% individual mobility to a system where we have mostly mo multimodal use of uh, all the vehicles in an efficient way. And I think in this regard, I won't recommend that uh, maybe Klein Machno, or for Klein Machno it might be good to have a rail connection again for the city, but for other smaller villages or smaller cities it might also help to have the link to the next mass transit to then go to the city center. And that is a question, how can you do um, um, uh, economic, um, reliable and economic feasible system which uh, closes the link to the last mile um, from home to your public transport operator. And I think um, if we can set up and have an integration of the new mobility services with public transport, which I think is already now in the minds of the people to link those systems, then uh, we can also have a good mobility system and make the mobility transition work. Thanks, Lot. Sure. Yeah, so uh, I also thinking of, of the railroad thing. Uh, I came here by train from Stockholm, 
with a nine months old baby. That was terrible. <laughs> it was not fun. And I, I, me and my husband thought, okay, let's try this. Let, let's try do the train thing. And uh, we calculate. So I calculated how much CO2 do we save. So, so we saved 730 kilograms CO2 doing the train instead of the flight. It was 135 euros more expensive going by train, and it was 12 hours more traveling time going by train. It was also, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was night train Stockholm Copenhagen with a nine months old baby. No, she didn't sleep. And then we had to do changing trains in Frederica and in Hamburg. And then finally we get to Berlin. And we sh when we're changing trains, you know, bag, stroller, baby, everything. Is this the right track? I don't know. Everybody else is running. Oh, they changed the track, but they're saying it in German and we don't know German. <laughs> so it's terrible. But the thing is, it's like, was it worth it? I don't know, because I don't know what is 730 kilograms of CO2 worth, because we don't pay CO2 today. We pay money, and we sometimes understand time, but the value of CO2, we have no clue, for real, and we never use it. So it's like, when are we going to start paying what we actually do? <laughs> and, and I'm a bit like uh, scared of it, because everybody wants to stop flying or stop eating meat, but we keep on doing it because we Ah, it's too difficult to change. But we actually don't pay the price for what we're doing, and I think that's a real hassle. And it's the same when it comes to batteries. They are like, oh, but uh, does it matter where our raw material comes from? Do people ask for it? Well, Norfolk hope that in the future people will ask for, okay, what's the CO2 footprint of this battery? Because otherwise there's no reason to doing it on an electric car, right? But today no one is paying for the CO2 of the battery. They're just looking at the price per kilowatt hour. They don't look CO2 at kilowatt hour. And I think that's a regulation that I really I'm waiting for, like, when do I get an amount of CO2? This is your, you know, as you had in the World War II. In Sweden, you get coupons, like, this is how much butter you get for a year, or this is how much bananas or beers you get for a year. And I would like to have my, this is how much CO2 you can spend this year. And I'm still waiting for, for that to happen, because we talk about it, but it doesn't really happen. So yeah, that would be interesting. I'm very, very grateful I that this point came now from the panel. Um, I may, I may I have a yes, second? Please. Um, so it was 130 something extra euros? Okay, uh, and 700 something kilos. Yeah, it's basically you paid a little bit less than 20 euros to plant seven trees. This is how much you saved. Uh, an average tree consumes 100 kilos of CO2 over the lifetime. So seven trees. Can we all plant trees and just take the plane instead? That's also that difficult. That answer will come tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but, I, but I would like to stick with the CO2 and the CO2 price for um, yeah, the last minute, basically, because um, in, in this panel so far we didn't talk about that. Um, in, in the first panel, I think it was uh, Matthias uh, who said that the signal we gave in, in Germany by politically um, setting the initial price to 10 euros is not very helpful. Um, and uh, because uh, not very helpful in, in, in two directions. Uh, number one, it does not have any effect in terms of changing behavior at the moment in the right direction. And I would say even the opposite. If you give it such a low price, and be it initially, you're really deferring from the, from the problem. You, 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 you say, okay, it's only worth 10 euros at the moment, and, and just the opposite, you, you do not raise um, minds of, of people to, to change behavior. Um, talking about this, this pricing, it would be very interesting how you perceive the discussion about CO2 and CO2 pricing, because from my perspective, a, a high or higher CO2 price is one of the only things I would really ask a regulator, a European regulator for to set, um, because if this price is existing from the rest, funding, technology and other worlds, everything else will follow to make things more well, economic again. Yes, obviously, you need to fade in this, but um, still, what's your opinion on, on this obstacle at the moment? 
I would go even a step further to include all externals. When talking about all externals, I mean the whole manufacturing cycle of any kind of product. So how to deal with waste when manufacturing a product? How to deal when a product uh, reaches its end of life? How to disassemble such a product and deal with the waste out coming out of it? So this is the main question, not only CO2 price. Thanks. I, I think it's yeah more than the CO2 itself, there are a lot of other environmental impacts that I think should be um, taken into account. And um, something that came to mind when you mentioned the, the, the um, obstacles to uh, opening mines in the north of, of Europe is just how detached we really are from the, the impacts that, we, that our demand generates and how um, perhaps if we, if we locally paid those prices, not only of the CO2, but the uh, you know, other ecological uh, uh, destruction, maybe the, the political will to, to do something about it would be higher. Um, just a thought. Mm -hmm. So transparency. About Local. Yeah. Local Any last comment from your side? Um, first of all, thank, for, for, thank you for all the inputs. Uh, I want to state one comment here. Um, I do believe that humans in society are very lazy. And I'm saying this because, Christian, I have to disagree a bit with the last mile, uh, um, like last mile solution. Nature has given you two legs and two feet, and you can actually walk. So, no, really, like uh, in, in Hamburg, uh, the public transport is quite okay. And I have to take a bus to get to work, and I have to take uh, the train. And I walk to the bus stop, and then I walk from the train station to the work. And I, it, as long as it is like one or two kilometers, I do believe that uh, it's possible to walk, actually. I did it, I did it, did it myself, is it possible? Uh, plus, plus uh, the, the next thing, um, this whole mobility discussion also comes up because we don't, I believe you don't need a car for one or two kilometers. It doesn't matter if it's a combustion car, electric car. You don't need a car for one or two kilometers. You have other ways of transportation, unless you have to transport like a dog and a child. And they, okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, of course, I, this I understand. But I know many of my friends taking their car at minus 20 degrees in Germany, driving one or two kilometers to a train station. And that's also like not good for the car or if it even would be electrical car not probably not to the best thing with a battery just this as a remark thank you well thank you very much